Well, let me also welcome you this morning. My name is Andy Morgan, one of the pastors here at Faith Church, and it is uh, good to be able to uh, gather today. You've probably heard the expression that there are only two, two things certain in life, death and taxes. Yeah, unfortunately, I think we all know where our taxes are headed. Um, but anyway, beside the point, um, I want to add a third to that. Unfortunately, I want to add a third to that, um, and that's failure. At some point in time, we are all going to fail at something. Maybe you failed a test in school. Maybe you failed to make the cut on the sports team. Maybe you failed to get into the marching band at Michigan State University. Okay, that was me. <laughs> but we're all going to fail at something. You didn't get into the school that you wanted to get into. You didn't land the job that you wanted to. Maybe you failed in a relationship that was really important to you, and you know that you're the one that kind of messed it up. And so we all deal with failure. At some point, we're all going to fail. Failure is kind of universal. How we deal with failure can determine the rest of our lives. See, failure, when, when it happens, it creates this barrier. You know, we're going along in life, and then all of a sudden we fail, and it creates this barrier of who we want to be, who we think we are, who we want to live into. It, it creates this barrier. Am I ever going to be able to be who I want to be? Am I ever going to be able to do the things I want to do? Failure creates that barrier of our being able to see the potential in our life or living into the possibilities. And so if we allow that barrier to remain there, it, it defeats us. Failure has then defined us. This is now who I am. If we fail to make the sports team and we, and we tell ourselves, well, I'm not good at sports and so I'm never going to do it again, that, that failure has defined us and it's defeated us. If we fail in a relationship and we tell ourselves, well, that was too painful, I'm never going to let anyone love me and I'm never going to love anyone again, that barrier has defined us. It's defeated us. When we allow our failures to be kind of that final barrier in our lives, I'm never going to move beyond that. I don't want to move beyond that. I'm too afraid to move beyond that. Then that failure has become fatal. It's killed our future, our potential, our possibility. We cannot allow our failure to define us or defeat us. And it doesn't have to. Our failures do not need to be final. They do not need to be fatal. And we know this because of a meal that Jesus had with his disciples along the shores of the Sea of Galilee. It, it wasn't a dinner. It wasn't a lunch. Well, maybe it was a lunch. Maybe it was brunch. We don't know. It was, we kind of think of it as a breakfast we hear this story from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 12. It says, Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught Nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. And he called out to them, friends, have you any fish? No, they answered. He said, well, throw your nets on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord as soon as Simon Peter heard, the, heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garments around him for he had taken them off and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boats, towing the net full of fish. For they were not far from the shore and about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. 
Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. So let's go back and look at the first word from this passage. Afterwards. After what? What's the context for this meal, this breakfast with Jesus? What has just happened? Well, if we read back, what has just happened is that Jesus has been crucified and then he rose from the dead. He appeared to some of the disciples. So this is after the crucifixion and the resurrection. This is also after all of the disciples had failed Jesus. They, they'd failed to stay with him during, uh, during the night when they needed him the most. They all failed him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it was after Peter, it was after Peter had failed Jesus three times. If you remember the events around the arrest of Jesus, Peter and the disciples were in the Garden of Gethsemane when Judas came and betrayed Jesus with a kiss. That was the sign. The soldiers then come in and arrest Jesus. And as Jesus is being arrested, maybe the time he would need the most support, all the disciples ran away. They all failed. Peter, at least, follows along in the shadows. Jesus is taken to the high priest's house where he's questioned, Peter follows along, he's in a courtyard, and as Jesus is being questioned, Peter's being questioned, and three times, Peter fails. Fails to acknowledge that he knows Jesus. Fails to acknowledge that he has anything to do with Jesus. He fails. But this is not the first time Peter has failed. We read through the Gospels, Peter's kind of the poster child of failure. He, he's an interesting character because we see in Peter incredible, great aspirations. We also see in Peter incredible and great failure. Remember the night that Peter walked on water with Jesus? The disciples are out on a boat. They're, they're halfway you know, across the sea and Jesus comes walking to them on the water. And Peter says, Jesus, if it's you, then tell me to come and walk with you on the water. And Jesus says, well, come. And so Peter gets out of the boat and he is walking on the water with Jesus. Incredible success. Great aspiration. I want to be like Jesus. And he gets out of the boat and he's walking on water. But what happens? He begins to look at the Water, he feels the wind. He's all of a sudden thinking, I can't do this. And he starts to sink. He starts to drown and Jesus has to reach down into the water and lift him up. And he says to him, you have little faith. Great aspirations and great failure. Then there was the day that Jesus asked all the disciples, who... Who do you say that I am? Everyone else has their opinion of me. Who do you think I am? And Peter boldly says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Great aspiration, great faith. Jesus says, well, let me tell you what it's going to mean for me to be the savior. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be arrested, tried, and crucified. That's what Jesus says. Peter rebukes him. No way, Jesus. We are not going to let that happen. That is not what's going to happen. Okay, here is Peter telling the son of God what's going to happen. Great failure. Great success. You are, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. But great failure by rebuking Jesus and telling him how things are going to go. Such a failure that Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. For you have in mind the things of man, not the things of God. Great aspiration, great failure. 
And then we have that scene in the garden. Jesus is with his disciples. He's visibly distraught. He says, pray with me. He specifically takes Peter and, and Andrew and John, but he takes Peter with him and he says, pray with me. And Jesus goes off and he prays and he comes back and Peter is sleeping. Two more times, Jesus pleads with them, stay awake and pray with me. And three times they fall asleep. Great aspiration, great failure. And then when the soldiers come, they flee. And then Peter denies Jesus, denies knowing him three times. Failure of Peter time and time again. Do you ever wonder why all these stories of Peter's failure are recorded in the Bible? Peter was the one that Jesus said, you're going to be the rock. You're going to be the foundation of the church. The movement that's going to continue my mission and ministry. You are going to be the leader. And yet time and time again in scripture, all we hear about is Peter's failure. Why do we see all these failures? Well, the answer is simple. They are recorded in the Bible for you, for me. Because we're all going to fail. Failure is universal. Peter failed. And God wants us to know that, yes, you're going to fail. But your failure does not need to define you. Your failure does not need to defeat you you. Our failures are are not the barrier to us becoming who God has called us to be. And we know this because Jesus made breakfast for his disciples. Making breakfast for Peter and the rest of the disciples on the beach is Jesus' way of saying, look, I'm not going to hold your failures against you. There's going to be forgiveness. There's going to be reconciliation. There is this barrier here when you fail to to love me and stand with me, but I'm going to remove that barrier so once again you can stand with me and love me. Jesus forgives them, and he gives them all a second chance. What I love about this story is that Jesus could have done this anywhere at any time, but he chose to do it at a meal. A meal where Jesus provided the bread and the fish, made a fire. We don't often see Jesus fishing and baking in the Gospels. I don't know where he got the bread and the fish. I like to think that somehow he caught them, caught the fish, kneaded the bread, made it, built the fire, got the coals going, prepared the fish to be broiled, grilled. I like to think of Jesus lovingly making this meal because He wanted to provide it for his disciples. How do you feel when you make a meal for people you love? I know like Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, birthdays, anniversaries, whatever it is. I mean, I know there's a lot of stress around it, but isn't there something wonderful about preparing a meal for those you love? It's it's special. At least it should be. It's a... It's an intimate kind of moment. I am giving my time and my skill or lack thereof, you know, but I'm giving it to you. And Jesus does that. Jesus does that for them. He lovingly provides for them. Preparing the meal is an act of not only forgiveness, it is an act of love. It's a moment of forgiveness, but it's a special moment of forgiveness for Peter. Because after breakfast, Jesus kind of takes him aside for this conversation. Pick up the story in John chapter 21, verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. 
Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And then the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him this third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Three times, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Which means that three times, Peter had the opportunity to look Jesus full in the eyes and say, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Three times, Peter had denied knowing Jesus. So now three times, Peter has the opportunity to express his love. Three times Peter had failed. Now three times Jesus is giving Peter the opportunity to succeed. To show, to voice his love and commitment. It's an intimate moment between Peter and Jesus. And yet we hear about it. Which tells us that Peter shared this story. I don't think Peter shared this because it makes him look good. I think he shares this to let everyone know that with Jesus, there's forgiveness. That, that with Jesus, our, our failures are not the end of the story. That there's grace and there's mercy and there's also the opportunity for new life. Here's the thing. Jesus doesn't need to hear Peter proclaim his love. Peter said it. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus did not need to hear Peter say this. So why did he ask him? Maybe Peter needed to say it. Maybe Peter needed to hear himself proclaim his love. Maybe Peter needed to be reminded that his failure was no longer a barrier. He had an opportunity to be faithful and to stand with Jesus. Maybe Peter needed to know that his failure did not define him. And then after asking Peter to share his love for him, Jesus does something brilliant. Why are we surprised, right? Jesus does something brilliant. It's not just forgiveness. It's not just an opportunity to say once again how much Peter loves Jesus. It's an opportunity for Jesus to cast a vision of Peter's future. No longer is there this barrier for who Peter's going to become. There's forgiveness and now there's the potential and the possibility to live into who God has called Peter to be. Jesus said... You're no longer going to be called Simon. I'm going to call you Peter, which means rock, because you're going to be the leader of the movement once I'm gone. You're going to be the foundation on which the church, my movement, my people are going to be built. And here's Jesus giving Peter a vision of what this is going to look like. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Care for my people. Be the shepherd that you were created to be. Peter, you're not a failed fisherman anymore. You're a successful shepherd who will care for and tend my people and upon you will build the church. You know, the first time that Jesus invited Peter to follow him, it was to be a fisherman, a fisher of men and women, you know, to kind of work with Jesus and gather people together. The second time that Jesus calls him, it's to be the shepherd. 
Peter, you've seen what it means for me to be the good shepherd. Now I'm calling you to be a good shepherd. Walk in my path. Do what I've done. Peter, you're not going to be a fisherman anymore. You're not just going to gather people together. You're not going to care for them. You're now going to love them. Just as I have forgiven you and loved you in this meal, I'm asking you to love and care for and tend and at times forgive my people. Jesus is casting this vision so that the failure of Peter will no longer define him. But Jesus is saying, this is who you are. This is who you can become. Your failure is just gone. It's wiped away. What we need to hear today is that God doesn't just love us. And God doesn't just forgive us. God is working to help us see the potential and the possibility that he has for our lives. Too often we allow our failures to define us. Well, I can't, I can't be anything more than what I am because every time I try, I fail. I can't be you know, the person that I want to be because every time I try, I, I fail. And so our failures define us. And God is saying, I have so much more for you. Your failures do not need to define you. We need to, to have that God-given vision of our lives. We need to see the potential that God has for us at every age and stage of life and see that God is calling us into that. Will we fail? Absolutely. Will taxes go up? Absolutely. Will we all die someday? Absolutely. Three things we're certain of. But our failure does not need to defeat us or define us. It's not the end God's love can lead us into so much more. What we need to hear today is that God doesn't just forgive us. God has a, a plan for us, a future for us. And Jesus can lead us beyond this barrier of failure to be all that we want to be, all that God has called us to be. God, God does this for all of us. And God does it all for one reason. He loves us. Why did Jesus go out of his way to make this meal? Why does he, why does he pour himself into making a fire, catching fish, making bread, making sure it's all prepared, inviting them to be part of it? Why does he do this? Why does, Peter, why does Jesus take Peter aside specifically and, and nurture him and love him and forgive him and vision cast into his life and into his future? Why does Jesus do all of this in this meal? There's only one reason. He loves them. After all of our failures, why does God continue to forgive us? It's because God loves us. God loves us that much. God loves us that completely. God is never wanting our failures to be that barrier. He always wants to help us see the future, his future for us. Have you ever wondered if God gets tired of forgiving you? Oh my gosh, I do. One more time, God. One more time, God. One more time, God. One more time, God. Oh God, you must get tired of this. I'm tired of it. And we begin to think, well, this is the time. This is the, this is the failure that God's not going to forgive. Or, you know what? I failed so many times. This really is a barrier in my life. We begin to wonder if God will forgive us or help us move forward. The author and pastor Tim Keller said that if Jesus held on to his love for the disciples during all of their failures, and he could endure the powers of hell coming against him, that he can endure our failures too. Think about it. The disciples, 
utterly failed Jesus when they needed him the most. They all ran away. They all deserted him. The one who was going to be the foundation of the church denied even knowing him. And Jesus forgave all of that, even while the powers of hell were working against him on the cross. And yet, Jesus forgave them. Really, if Jesus can forgive them through that scenario, he can forgive us. There's nothing that God can't forgive. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8, what, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? Can these things separate us? No. Paul writes, in all things we are more than conquerors through him, through Christ who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our failure cannot separate us from the love of God. If death and demons can't separate us from God's love, our failures cannot separate us from God's love. If, if troubles and hardship, if persecution and famine can't separate us from God's love, then let's be honest. Our failures, as bad as we think they are, are not that powerful. They cannot separate us from the power of God's love. Our failures Never have the final say. Love does. Think of it this way. When our failure meets up with God's love, love wins every time. Love wins every time. Go back to Peter after breakfast. Peter left the meal, went on to become the shepherd of God's people. A few weeks later, P Peter is boldly proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit moves in Peter in such a way that thousands of people place their faith in Jesus. Thousands of people are baptized. The church is formed and Peter has become the foundation. Peter has become the rock. Do you think Peter did all of that because he was motivated by guilt and shame? I don't think so. Guilt and shame might motivate us, but only so far. What motivates someone to completely turn their life around? What motivates us to transform everything? It's not guilt. It is love. It's God's love for us. God's love is what needs to define us. And when it does, we fully live into the future God has for us. When we're confident and we are secure in God's love for us, we can then honestly evaluate, we can evaluate our failure. We can learn from them. We can grow from it. We can say, I'm not, I'm not going to walk that road again. I have, when, when we believe that and are confident in God's love for us, we can say, I have more power in me than I ever thought possible. When we are confident in God's love for us and our love for God, our failures are never final. That's why Jesus provided the meal. I love you. I'm providing this for you. That's why he gave Peter three opportunities to say, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. See, when we are confident in God's love for us and when we are confident in our love for God, our failures are wiped away. All things are made new. We can live into the best vision of ourselves that we can have. So no matter what you're facing today, God loves you. There's nothing that can separate God's love for you. You're forgiven. Your failures are gone. They are no longer a barrier. And God is here to begin to reveal to you the possibility and the potential that he has for your life. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Don't let your failures define you. Allow God's love to not only forgive you, but 
to give you the faith and the courage and the confidence to step out, to step out and once again follow Jesus. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we all fail in our lives. We all fail in our faith. We all fail at things maybe we want to do or try to do. And too often we allow those failures to really define who we are instead of trusting in your love, trusting in your grace, trusting in your power to move beyond them. I thank you, God, that your love for us is so strong that it defeats our failure every time. I thank you that your love invites us and calls us into a deeper relationship with you. God, I pray that the times that we've failed you, that, that maybe we, we have a hard time letting go of, I pray that we would be able to, to let go, to, to experience the grace of forgiveness. And God, I pray that you would open our eyes to see the best version of ourselves, who, who you call us to be, who God created us to be. God, may that vision lead us forward in life, in relationships, and in faith. Thank you, God, that every time, every time your love wins. God, we thank you for your love and we love you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.